Give him a yield. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Cow. Um, Mr. Taylor, Mississippi. Again, I want to thank the panel for being here. Early on, uh, when it came to debris removal, something that stuck out in my mind was the Corps of Engineers came to my home county, which had lost the county courthouse, both city halls, and basically gave them the option of saying, we estimate that debris removal should cost this much per cubic yard. We will let you put it out for bid. You do all the paperwork and we'll reimburse you up to this. Or given the fact that you guys don't even have a pocket calculator to your names, which was accurate, we'll do it. And let the Board of Supervisors make that decision. What I've really noticed in, in some of these uh, adjustments that have been dragging on for five years is the total lack of initiative on the part of HUD for housing or the Department of Education when it came to schools to find an expert who could look at a school or a building and say, this is our estimate of what it would cost to not only make it look like it did the day before the event, but bring it up to compliance with the laws that have been passed since that building was built, whether it's for asbestos, whether it's for the Americans with Disability Act, and say, this is what we have estimated it will cost to fix. This is what we will make available to you, or we will do it and absolve you of all responsibility. We'll do it, and we think we can bring it into this, that price. Given the enormous amount of money that, that has been spent and is still being requested. I'm still to this day appalled at what I, what I sense is a total lack of expertise within our nation as far as estimating what something should cost. And we ought to be the experts, not, not communities of four or 5,000 people. They can't afford an expert. We certainly have to afford an expert. What, if anything, has happened in the past five years to address those things? Um, I can't point to a, a specific instance that, where that's happened, and, and I guess that's why I've kind of belabored the point about, about FEMA using the cost estimating formula that Congress gave it. That, and, you know, and that goes back to when Director Witt was at FEMA when that was granted. Since that hasn't been implemented, everything FEMA worked on as far as developing expertise to be able to do cost estimating right at the start of the disaster to try to reach an agreement um, and used industry experts to develop all that has just lain dormant for those 10 years. Uh, you know, I think FEMA can have people that are expert at, uh, at estimating. They do a lot of disasters every year. They can have some staff that's, that's, that's good at estimating. And I think they've also tried to at least encourage a bit more that, that the local governments themselves can begin to establish those kind of contracts for debris removal. And, and give them a greater cost share if they have those kind of things in place. But the overall expertise you're discussing, I think, at least as far as FEMA PA projects, uh, wouldn't really develop because uh, I think we were staying with the system we had and not with the, the authority Congress had given to maybe increase that, uh, that expertise. Going back to Congressman Cowell's observation, which we saw the same thing in many of the Mississippi Gulf Coast communities that rely on sales tax for their revenue. When all the stores are gone, obviously the sales tax revenue is gone. But then when the big box stores come back, you will have a spike since everyone is replacing every refrigerator, every air conditioner, every microwave oven. So for a short period of time, there'll be a huge spike in sales tax, but then it gets back to a desperate situation. To what extent are the federal agencies empowered to just on their own turn to their bosses in Washington and say, look, I have looked at this. These guys cannot repay the loans. I am asking you, FEMA, to forgive them. Why do you even, in many instances, when, when it's just blatantly obvious in some of these communities, why do you even have to wait for a town of 1,500 or 2,000 or 3,000 to hire an attorney and a staff to put together that, when, when in so many instances it's just obvious? Does anyone wish to address that? 
you know, I've worked on CDLs for a number of years, going back to, to Hurricane Hugo and Hurricane Maryland in, in the era. Um, and I tend to agree with you. There is, a, there is a big spike. I mean, the whole purpose of the CL program is there's going to be a drop in the tax base because homes are destroyed, people are moving out. But eventually, in, in, in some cases after disasters, it's like you have a real big spike on that. Um, it's, I, think, I think the idea of the CDLs is a sound idea that communities do need the working capital. They do need to, to, uh, to, to pay the police force and the firemen and those types of things because of that base, but they are eventually going to recover. But you know, they're going to get back to where they were before, so they're going to be living at the same level, but yet trying to pay a, a big federal loan back, too, at the same time. So, you know, take, I think that needs to be taken into account also. Even though they did return to their tax base, now they have the additional liability of paying back this federal loan. And I think if you, you know, again, I mentioned before, um, historically there's about a 95, 96 percent default rate because communities have just demonstrated through their financials that they just can't recover. And I think there has, that has to be taken into consideration when the loans are, are up for cancellation. And I'd, I'd mention, too, and I can have to check on this, but I think another thing historically is that when CDLs first began, very briefly, um, it was a grant program and not a loan program. And I think when I was at FEMA years back, and I think when we would look at the administrative costs of looking at the finances of many communities and sending auditors down and trying to guesstimate things, and, and the cost involved in hiring accounting firms to go to various counties and, and look at, uh, certainly the, what we came back to is <clears throat> maybe another approach would be maybe loans not of that size, but maybe a smaller size that just become grants to smaller communities rather than trying to put both the feds and the communities through that kind of process, because uh, in some cases you can end up spending as much on the administration of, of the loan as, as on the, the interest on the loan itself. So it, one of the suggestions that was made, at least back in 2000, was to consider making it a partial grant program. But given all the other costs on the federal government, it's not the kind of thing that gets a lot of traction. Mr. McCarthy, and again, I very much appreciate the chairwoman. I'm not even a member of the subcommittee, so she's very kind to let me participate. But what, if anything, if it happened again tomorrow, only this time it was coastal North Carolina or coastal Georgia, or Ch Charleston for the second time in 20 something years, if it happened again tomorrow, what assurances can you give me that it would be done better? than it's been done since 2005. And if you can't give me any assurances that it would be done better, what's, what specific recommendations would you or anyone on that panel make for changes in the law so that we don't keep making the same mistakes? Uh, Mr. Taylor, I want to I say that I think there have been improvements. And, and uh, when people ask me about the Pecamera Act, it wasn't retroactive to what Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana went through, but I think the pilot programs from that project were useful. I mean, FEMA experimented in Iowa and Texas and found out they could do something about helping to uh, restore the rental uh, inventory rather than just thinking about trailers, of thinking of fixing up apartment buildings in areas so that there's more. And another thing I always point to is is I think when we had all the people dispersed around the country in 38 states after Katrina trying to meet up with family members, uh, FEMA at that point didn't have a case management authority where you could actually have them talk to people and make them aware of what, they were, what services they were entitled to and how they could be linked to, with, back with their family. I think there have been small improvements. And, and, I think that, uh, and I think that Mr. Fugate at FEMA really has reinvigorated the agency to, to be looking forward. And I think you put your finger on it, initiative. I mean, you, you can't just have a law that sits there or regulations that sit there. You have to have administrative initiative to make it work because you can't, you can't legislate the spirit of an organization. You can only give them the tools. I think Congress has given the administration a number of tools uh, to make disaster recovery work better, but it's partly how it's administered that really counts. Uh, yes, Mr. Taylor, certainly. Uh, Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, ma'am.